All right. Hey, folks. Uh, thanks for joining us. Welcome to FPF's second summer special webinar. Uh, we're going to be covering California's new privacy law today, C uh, the California Consumer Privacy Act, or CCPA, as we've been calling it, um, and how it relates to child and student privacy. So we're, uh, we're very thrilled to bring you a lineup of, of good speakers on that topic. Uh, and before we get into the, the discussion, I have a couple things I wanted to talk about on at the top of the call. First, um, I want to let everyone know that we are under Chatham House rules. So we are completely off the record and no comments that are made on this call are going to be uh, attributable. <laughs> Sorry, I'm having trouble attributable to uh, any of the individual speakers. Um, if anyone wants comments on the record, they'll have to reach out to the speakers individually um, offline. So even the question and answer at the end of the call, we're gonna be off the record. Um, so beyond that, we are recording this. And so if folks are uh, either regist registrants of this call or are members of our working group, we'll be providing the recording afterwards so feel free to share that within your organization but please do um, keep it a little close um, so then beyond that um, if you're interested in this topic and would like to take a bit of a deeper dive we have internally uh, a, a comparison between ccpa and gdpr available for fpf members if you're interested in that it doesn't quite apply to, to student privacy specifically but it is a, a good in-depth look at um, the law and finally, um, we have a Google Doc for um, anonymous questions. If anyone would like to ask questions throughout the call, we'll have a question and answer session after. And we are able to um, answer questions anonymously there. So we want to have a good open conversation. Um, so at this point, I'm going to turn to our first speaker. Um, our first speaker is Ariel Johnson, who is policy counsel at Common Sense Media and works closely with this law. So Ariel, uh, I, am, I unmuted you. You want to go ahead and uh, take it away? Sure. Thank you, Tyler. I'm going to try to share my slides. Okay. So I wanted to give people some background into how this law came to be. I think many of you have probably heard it was sort of went from introduction to passage in a week, um, which is kind of true and, and kind of not true. So almost a year ago, there was an initiative filed in California. People can file um, initiatives to get them put on the ballot. It was the California Consumer Privacy Act, and one of the lead proponents, proponents of the initiative was Alistair McTaggart. And the privacy initiative that he filed would offered consumers rights to know about the categories of information collected about them and the people that information was sold or shared to, the right to tell companies to stop selling or sharing information, um, it allowed for people to bring lawsuits and also for public entities like the attorney general to enforce and I think provided for fines of up to $7,500 per violation. And it also established a consumer privacy fund. And parts of this initiative were written very broadly and parts of this initiative were also written sort of very prescriptively, for example, in the terms of the right to say no to the selling or sharing of information um, you had to have it specified uh, like a button that said, do not sell my information. So it was introduced in the fall and it went through a signature gathering process. And in May, they announced that they had enough signatures to qualify for the ballot. I think they had something like over 600,000 signatures and they only needed like 380,000 th signatures. So the initiative got some support, and it also got some opposition. There was a lot of opposition from industry, oops, excuse me, from industry who felt that it was sort of too broad and were extremely afraid of the private rate of action. Um, there was some opposition or at least neutral feelings from some privacy advocates who didn't feel like it went far enough and give enough rights to people. And then, you know, there was the legislature who sort of felt like it was their job to legislate a complicated topic like privacy. So some members of the legislature 
sort of struck a deal with the initiative maker that said kind of, if we can get a bill passed by the deadline for which you can pull your initiative, will you pull your initiative? And um, McTaggart agreed. Knowing, I think in part that he was gonna face, you know, a huge fight from all manners of, of industry if this initiative went forward. So June 22nd, uh, the legislature introduced the California Consumer Privacy Act, and they, they did this in the vehicle of AB 375, which was formerly a broadband privacy bill of Representative Chow's. And I think it went through one amendment. Pro it was introduced on a Thursday or Friday, amended slightly on Monday. And by Thursday of that week, on June 28th, it had passed the House and the Senate. And... Um, the bill was signed into law and the initiative was pulled. So some things that are in the law now as it stands, it's the first broadly applicable consumer privacy law in America that's not sectorally focused, not just focused on financial information or health information or kids information, though kids do have special protections. Um, it gives consumers notice and transparency rights. It gives them access, portability and deletion rights lets them say no to the sale of information, or if they're under 16, they have to say yes before their information is sold. And I know other speakers on this call will go into these in much more detail, so I'm just giving a brief overview here. And also guarantees equal service and price, um, whether or not people are exercising their privacy rights. Now when the legislature, legislature passed the law, there were some compromises made Aid in terms of what this law looked like versus what the initiative looked like. And you see a lot of the initiative still in the law. Like you still see, for example, the do not sell my information button. Um, but sort of what was given up was on the sort of from the initiative um, backer side was they gave up some of the private rights of action in large part. And what consumers got was sort of more additional substantive rights. So under the initiative, you could get access to the categories of your information. Under the law, you can get access to your specific pieces of information and the right to port that. You have new rights as a consumer to delete information. There's this opt-in consent for kids under 16, which did not exist in the initiative. Um, there's some differences in how the law versus the initiative governed selling or sharing information. The Initiative applied to selling or sharing um, sort of extremely broadly defined and as sharing even for no benefit whatsoever was sort of considered a sale under the initiative. That has been changed so that there has to be some consideration received for sharing information in order for it to qualify as a sale under the law. Um, the initiative also required that companies specifically say the other businesses and third parties that they sold information to under the law, you get categories of companies that your data is sold to. And then those companies are prohibited from further sale unless they've given you your notice and opt out opportunity or opt in opportunity. And as I noted before, a big difference and a reason that sort of the industry went somewhat neutral in response to the law is that it provided a more narrow private right of action with respect to certain data breaches of a more narrow swath of personal information than is covered in the law otherwise. Um, and otherwise the attorney general is the main enforcer. So common sense is one of the co-sponsors of the law and from our perspective, this law and others like it and stronger than it are sorely needed. You know, Kids are America's most tracked generation, and we believe that everyone deserves the opportunity to make informed choices about the who, the what, the where, the why information is collected and how it appears online. And some recent polling we've done with SurveyMonkey, we saw that nine in 10 sites saw it was nine in 10 parents and teens think it's very important that sites clearly label what data they're collecting and how it will be used. This is something that the law would do. And then 77% of parents say it's very important for sites to ask permission before selling or sharing information. And for kids under 16, 
the law would do this. And for parents, the, it would be an opt-out rate. So given how fast this law passed, one thing we're asked frequently is what's happening next? Um, on the left of the screen, hopefully you can see Alistair McTaggart there speaking with uh, Senator um, Hertzberg and Representative Chow, um, two of the three legislative sponsors. Um, he has vowed to keep fighting for privacy protections. Uh, we've also heard that some sectors are vowing to limit the reach of this law. Um, one thing that we know we'll be seeing is a cleanup bill, SB 1121, that should occur in August that's going to address, as far as I understand, technical cleanup issues, typos, repetitive language. Uh, the law does provide for an attorney general rulemaking, and the attorney general is required to provide more regulations and guidance on certain things, like, for example, the price discrimination that I talked about. Um, and how to provide various notice rights. It can also offer rulemaking on all manner of other things if it so chooses. So that's coming up next because the law goes into effect January 1, 2020. Um, and then, you know, likely we will see other bills in California addressing other things in this law. Imagine we will see other state bills addressing consumer privacy and as we've been seeing in the news a lot in the last couple of weeks, maybe we'll even see something at the federal level. So that's sort of what we're anticipating happening next um, now that the law has passed. All right, thanks Ariel. Uh, great rundown. Um, so we're gonna hold all the questions until the end and do kind of one consolidated Q&A for everybody. Um, but now we're going to turn things over to Emily Tabatabai. Emily is a, a partner at ORIC and has been working hard to get up to speed with uh, California's law and is an expert. So, uh, Emily, you want to uh, take it away from here? Sure. Thanks, Tyler. Can everyone see my screen okay? Yeah, we see it coming through. Perfect. Okay. So, I'm tasked with explaining what the law is and how it applies to uh, children and students. Um, in the interest of uh, making sure that we're all on the same page, I'm going to go through some of the requirements of the law generally, um, understanding that there's a ton of nuance. There's also a lot of um, debate and provisions that are open to interpretation. I'm going to skip all the nuance. Uh, forgive me. Don't take anything that I say to the bank. There's a lot of exceptions and exceptions to those. I'm happy to answer any questions if you want to interrupt with a, a point for clarification but wanted to just run through what the law requires at the high level to then focus on how it applies specifically to children. Okay, so just generally, and, and not to focus too much on what Ariel just said, but the law applies to businesses with annual gross revenue of over 25 million, businesses that buy, receive, or sell, or share uh, personal information of California consumers, households, or devices or businesses that derive more than 50% of their revenue from selling consumers' personal information. Um, let's not even dig into what that could potentially mean for each of one of your businesses because there's a lot of debate there still. A business, though, the law applies primarily to businesses, which are defined as legal entities that do business in California, um, including brick and mortar data collection, not just online data collection, um, and which collects the consumers, uh, the California consumers' personal information and that alone or jointly with others determine the purpose and the means of the processing. Now that, that language is intended, I believe, to be somewhat similar to the GDPR concept of a controller versus a processor. So the business is the subject of this regulation. They're those entities which determine how the data is going to be collected and how it's being used. And then consumers apply to natural natural persons who are resident of California, however identified, including by a unique identifier. Okay, another thing we have to remember when we go through this discussion is that the act defines personal information extremely broadly. So it covers all the usual suspects like name, social, all those things. It also includes tracking data and unique identifiers, um, including, and then they enumerate a bunch of examples like um, IP addresses, cookies, beacons, pixels, tags, ad ID, um, 
probabilistic identifiers or any other persistent identifier that can be used to recognize a consumer, family, or device over time and across services. Uh, it also includes behavioral and profiling data, so things like browsing history, search history, um, purchasing history, including products that were obtained or even considered, uh, purchasing tendencies, um, and inferences drawn from all of the foregoing to create a profile that reflects the consumer's preferences, characteristics, psychological trends, and attitudes. Now, it's clear that they were trying to capture as much information as possible, including information that a lot of companies historically have tried to argue isn't really um, personal information, if it's just um, associated with someone's ID or device or browsing data. Um, that uh, you know, non-PII definition is kind of no longer in vogue or, or broadly accepted, but this statute wants to drive that point home. Um, it's also uh, important to point out that this information the behavioral and profiling history and stuff like that is considered personal information by the definition. Although technically speaking, um, it could be excluded from personal information uh, if it's been de-identified, which means if it cannot be reasonably um, identify or link, relate to, describe, or being capable of being linked to a particular consumer or device. So, Companies that do collect this type of profiling data broadly to, to track, you know, trends and um, to try to improve their retail uh, 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 retail stocking and improve their products and services and things like that um, could maintain this information completely disassociated from any identifiers, so long as that information can't reasonably be re-identified and they have contractual protections in place to prevent the re-identification. Um, the definition of personal information also includes things like professional and personal background and sensory data, including audio, electronic, visual, thermal, olfactory, or similar information. I'm really curious to see how uh, the Attorney General provides guidance on how a company is supposed to provide notice of olfactory collection. <laughs> that will be um, fun to see. Okay, and then, you know, again, and I think Ariel already covered these but very briefly and extremely high level, here's what the CCPA requires. Businesses must disclose how they collect information, the types of data they collect, the specific points of data they collect about each individual consumer upon request, um, the categories of third parties with whom they share it, how they share it with third parties for business purposes. They have to provide access to the PI in a, in a format that's accessible for portability. Um, they have to respond to data deletion requests subject to a bunch of exceptions and they have that opt out. Um, they have to honor requests from the consumer to uh, cease the sale or disclosure of their personal information to a third party for a non-business purpose. The last thing I wanna highlight before we really get into the kids concept is that the CCPA provisions apply primarily to businesses and not necessarily uh, apply directly to service providers. Now, that's a concept that's somewhat similar under the GDPR, uh, the, con the GDPR concept of controllers versus mm -hmm. processors. But um, the CCPA doesn't uh, define service providers particularly clearly. There are several different provisions that refer to the concept of what we would consider to be a service provider, and they all define it slightly differently. Um, the technical definition in the statute is an entity that processes personal information on a business's behalf for a business purpose pursuant to a written contract with the business that prohibits the service provider from using the information for any purpose other than the business's purposes. And that, that uh, using it for a business purpose is clearly enumerated in the statute. There's a long list of what's considered to be a business purpose. And they're pretty broad. Um, it provides for a good amount of flexibility, but they're also limited by virtue of being enumerated in the statute. And what this means is that service providers um, aren't subject directly to a lot of the consumer rights obligations. Um, instead, when a business receives a deletion request, that business is required to then pass the deletion request onto the service provider who can then respond and delete the information. Um, similarly, when a consumer requests that a business opt out of selling that consumer's information to third parties, um, that does not apply when the business is giving the information to a service provider. That's, that's excluded from the definition of sell is 
uh, information provided to a service provider who's performing the businesses, uh, business services on the businesses they have. Okay, now to get into the meat of my segment, how does the CCPA apply specifically to children? Um, well, generally, the CCPA provisions apply to uh, California consumers of all ages. So all of those um, provisions and obligations we've talked about thus far about the collection of consumers' personal information applies regardless of the consumer's age, right? Specifically, though, the definition of personal information also includes um, education information defined as information that is not publicly available personally identifiable information as defined in the FERPA. Okay, so uh, my, my colleagues are probably going to discuss, um, are, are certainly going to discuss how this statute may um, play with FERPA in, uh, in the next segment. But just briefly, I'll say that FERPA doesn't define anything as publicly available personally identifiable information. So there is some um, question as to what this includes. But I think we can all assume that the statute was intending to cover the type of information um, that's found in the student's educational record that's also covered by FERPA. Okay, and then the second thing that I think we've all heard of um, in, in terms of how the statute applies directly to children um, is this concept of the child's right to opt in. So we already discussed how the statute provides for um, a, a consumer to request opt out of having a business sell or disclose their personal information. That opt out obligation is flipped on its head when the consumer at question is a minor under the age of 16. So the statute says a business shall not sell by default, shall not sell the personal information of a consumer to a third party for a non-business purpose unless for children under 13, that child's parent or guardian has to affirmatively authorize the sale. Or for children under 16, the child consumer has to affirmatively authorize the sale. Now, I included something in parentheses there because the statute is uh, uh, somewhat ambiguous as to whether it applies to children under the age of 16 or whether it includes children who are 16 and under. Um, it's just a, a statutory drafting uh, a blip that surely will be straightened out in later revisions. But let's just call it children under 16 for now. The children under 16 have to affirmatively authorize the sale of their information to third parties for non-business purposes. And this obligation applies to businesses that have actual knowledge of the child's age, and the business cannot willfully disregard the child's age or it will deem to, be ha to have actual knowledge. Okay, so there's so many questions to unpack here, and I'm just gonna highlight a couple. Um, <laughs> one, how do you identify the child by age? Is there an obligation to age screen everyone who comes to your website? Now remember, personal information includes things like persistent identifiers, um, pixels, cookie IDs, um, all the information that's collected automatically from a user's device um, or browser when that user hits your homepage. So for a general audience site that has a lot of teens or that may be attracting a lot of teens, uh, is the site obligated to pause and do an age screen before allowing any third party trackers to execute on the site? Um, possibly. Uh, there's, there's also a provision, and I don't think I have a slide on this, but there is one provision in the statute that refers to um, the, the idea that a company may wish to comply with the, the provisions of the statute by having a separate California homepage just for California consumers. And I think that that idea makes some sense when you consider how challenging it would be for a website to age screen teenagers coming to their site um, to make sure that they're not collecting persistent identifier and tracking information from children under 16. If you have a California only website, um, that doesn't have any of those third party trackers present until the child or the user hits the screen and then somehow identifies themselves as being older. Um, that could be one way to easily identify uh, or to avoid the collection and quote sale of personal information from children under 16. Um, another question, you know, the statute permits the sale if you have affirmative authorization of the child or the child's parent. Um, for the children who are 13 to 16, what does that affirmative authorization mean? 
Is it synonymous with COPPA's verifiable parental consent standard? I think most of us are pretty familiar with that standard and we know that it sets a really high bar. Um, or do they use the phrase affirmative authorization to indicate a lesser standard, not quite rising to the level of uh, verifiable consent? Um, so th there's a lot of questions as to how companies are going to comply um, with these obligations related to children specifically under 16. Um, how similar that's going to look to the existing COPPA um, uh, compliance obligations, um, how much a company has to, how many steps the company has to take to determine whether or not the website visitors are under 16 or not. A um, lot of open-ended questions here and looking forward to hearing some, uh, hopefully getting some uh, uh, guidance from the AG on this topic. And on that note, I think we're gonna pass it along to um, my colleague, Sarah. Yeah, thanks. So, um, yeah, so just to give Sarah a little bit of an introduction, she is the Director of Education Policy at the Software and Information Industry Association. So, Sarah, do you want to uh, go ahead and take things away? Yeah. Um, there. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, you're coming through. Great. Let me get my screen shared and put it on the actual presentation. Um, there, how's that? Is that coming through? Yeah, we see it. Great. Oh. It's on presenter view though, Sarah. Pardon me? It's on, you want, you're on presenter view right now. <laughs> oh, I thought I turned that off. Um, it's fine, I don't have any notes. Um, I will figure that out. Let me, yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know how to fix this, so I'm just going to go go forward so I don't waste people's time. Um, okay. My technical errors. Uh, so hi everyone, um, and I look forward to your questions. I was looking at them as they um, on the Google Doc, and it does seem like a lot of people have questions on sort of the intersection of um, COPPA, FERPA. CCPA um, and probably generally other laws that are in this space and um, any of us that um, have followed policy for a while, um, we know that lawmakers don't always consider other laws when they are writing these, um, writing new laws or are not thinking about the unintended consequences. Amelia has a great um, presentation on sort of the unintended consequences of these student privacy laws. Um, but I think this one we will we will see what happens over the next two years and beyond to figure out sort of what clarifications are needed. Um, I wanted to I wanted to take some time to sort of talk about the different um, the different parts of FERPA and COPPA and CCPA and how they might interact together and how in areas where we really do need some um, some clarification. Um, but really, first, the one of the things that has not really been mentioned um, in depth yet um, is uh, the the need the, the section um, 193 1973-175, uh, um, which does outline that in the event of a conflict, the most privacy privacy protective law will control. Um, one of the things, like I said, that will need some clarification is how to determine what law is the most privacy protective. But as we're thinking about how CCPA interacts with other laws, um, we do um, we we do need to keep this in mind um, as uh, as something to consider um, and something that will need clarification. Um, um, so, Ariel mentioned at the beginning of this webinar that there are some key components to CCPA, um, and I am going to, like I said at the beginning, first going to go over some of these components and what what I see as um, their similar components in FERPA and COPPA. Um, the first one, um, the first component of CCPA that I'll talk about is notice and transparency rights. Um, under FERPA, um, and again, I know many of you on this call know this, but I do, I, I think it's important to level set a little bit. Um, so under FERPA, schools 
um, are the are the ones that are primarily obligated by FERPA. Um, schools must annually notify parents or eligible students. Um, eligible students are um, typically those in um, college over the age of 18, um, and a few more uh, uh, things. But um, uh, the, the notice must include various rights um, that parents or eligible students have under FERPA, and must also um, must also explain what the school, how the school defines a school official, and how they de define legitimate educational interest. Um, the and there's the Department of Education has posted an annual no a sample annual notice on their website. Um, so when you're thinking about how um, how um, notice happens um, in the schools, uh, this is probably one of the main um, federal laws that this is the main federal law that governs how that sort of that would happen. Um, and so I also pulled the text from the law that outlines what written consent looks like. Again, under FERPA, in order for a school to disclose personal information from a student's education records, they need to get written consent from the parents or eligible students. Um, uh, there are several exceptions to that. I'll go into one of them in a second, but um, the, the portion of the law does explain what the consent does need to look like. Um, and it's, it's fairly clear. Um, uh, Sarah, do you mind if I interrupt you real quick? We actually, we're getting only half the slides on, on the viewer. Is there a way to kind of zoom out uh, so that we can see the whole slide? Um, let me see. Does there we work? go. We, yeah, we got it. That's perfect. Okay. Okay. I thought I turned off my second screen, but then it came back. Um, so I will just, I will just continue with that. Thanks for interrupting. Um, um, so, so like I mentioned, um, there are exceptions to the um, consent requirements in um, FERPA. The, the one of the most common ones is FERPA school official exception, and I know we've gone over this in many um, FPF webinars, but I did want to point out the second bullet point in this um, that is likely to cause some confusion going forward. Um, I know um, Mark is going to go into this a little bit um, in the next section, but um, it, whenever, a, whenever a school uses the school official exception to share information with an ed tech company or even a school volunteer, um, that uh, school official um, needs to be under the direct control of the school with respect to the use and maintenance of those education records. And the Department of Education has recently pointed to in their Agora Cyber Charter letter um, that the best practices outlined in the department's model terms of service guidance are good to follow here um, as you're thinking about what direct control means. Um, whether it's through an agreement or through a terms of service, um, a school will need to be able to maintain direct control over a ed tech company or um, school volunteer, anyone else that they determine to be a school official. Um, and that is, an, like I said, an important to think, thing as we're considering um, deletion rights, which I'll get to later on. So again, in COPPA, um, Emily went over this a little bit, um, but uh, COPPA briefly, I'll go over, applies to online services directed to children under the age of 13. Um, COPPA requires a direct notice to parents before collecting information from kids. Um, and this, this notice must include several things like um, what is the specific information the company wants to collect and how it might be disclosed to others. Um, and again, this is this is a consent, uh, or parents must provide consent. So, as Emily said, um, we all are pretty familiar with verifiable parental consent. Um, but um, this is required for a company to collect information, um, personal information, as defined by COPPA. Um, and this consent can happen through a signed consent form or through dialing a 1-800 number. Um, or um, verifying a picture of a driver's license and comparing that to a second photo using facial recognition technology um, that was recently approved by the Federal Trade Commission. And also under COPPA, 
Um, COPPA allows schools to act as a parent's agent and consent um, to the collection of uh, kids' information on a parent's behalf, but that ability to consent is limited to an educational context. So as we get into um, the California law, um, there's a lot that's undefined, um, and I think this is going to be the theme of my presentation today and things that, um, things that need to be defined a little bit better. We see that they do have the section in the law that defines that children will need to provide, um, children or their parents will need to provide opt-in consent um, for the selling of data, um, and uh, consent is already already in play for those under the age of 13. Um, granted, it's not specific under COPPA to, um, to, be, to consent. It doesn't explicitly say you need to consent to the sale of data, but it does say you need to consent for any collection of personal information. Um, I find this section to be interesting in how it plays out with, in the most privacy protective um, section of the California law, and I'm Sort of, I've spent a, probably a lot more time than I should thinking about um, how these, how those two would play out, um, whether COPPA or CCPA um, are more privacy protective, or if they can be read in harmony, or if there's going to be a whole separate um, consent that needs to happen. Um, and I think that's probably something that'll get clarified by the Attorney General or um, through additional legislation or technical amendments. Um, I, I think we will, as the Attorney General provides more guidance on what notice and consent looks like, I think we'll, we'll be able to provide more guidance um, either through or, our organization or the great work that SPF does or any of my other colleagues on how um, ed tech companies when working with schools can, um, can provide notice or just even general technology companies uh, when working in this space can um, uh, can provide notice and consent and, and be transparent about their data practices. Um, so I'll go into now next the access portability and deletion rights. Um, uh, again, this is something, a theme in the California law, but first I'll go over the various themes in um, FERPA and in COPPA. So um, I, FERPA is at its heart an access, um, statu access law. Uh, when it was passed in 1974, it was intended to make sure that parents uh, knew what was going on in school and were able to get access to education records. Obviously, education records in 1974 look a little bit looked a little bit different than as they um, than they do now. Um, but it's it's remained constant. Um, if a parent um, requests access request access, um, the school must provide um, access, the ability to inspect and review those education records within 45 days. Um, parent, there are no deletion rights in FERPA, which is where we get into sort of the conflict with the California law. Um, parents and, or, and students may ask to amend the education record, um, and there's a process that they need to take there. Um, but the school does not need to amend that record, um, but the school needs to be able to, needs to notify why that decision was made and the parent and student needs to be able to request um, a, a right to request, a, have a right to request a hearing. Um, and uh, I'll get into this a little bit more in the California law, but portability, um, granted this is not necessarily the same intention under the California law, um, but I did want to point out that FERPA allows schools to disclose education records to another school if a student transfers. Um, there is not really, um, there's not a lot of discussion in FERPA about, but there has been a lot of discussion in the communities, um, education community about um, what rights do students have to their education records. Um, and some, some states have defined that a little further, whether it's they get to work with um, ed tech companies that are defined as school officials to download some of their products or or, or sign up for additional services. Um, but uh, their uh, portability is sort of a, a, that that's going to be a, a gray area in the FERP, in how the California law interacts with FERPA. In and now in COPPA, COPPA is an access um, and deletion. If, if a parent consented, um, 
they must be able to review the personal information collected and they companies need to delete the information if a parent requests it. It's pretty pretty clear cut there. Um, and, and I know I did see some questions that I'm sure we will get into a little bit later um, on that in the Google Doc. So like I mentioned in um, in the FERPA section, um, I am um, interested in how the access would be provided to parents um, if, if, and I know Mark is going to get into this a lot more, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but under this law, would an ed tech company need to working at the direction of the school and under the direct control of a school, would they need to provide access directly to the parent or would they be able to tell the parent, hey, you need to go to the school. We, first of all, can't verify who you are because we only have information on, this, on students and we don't, we can't disclose that information. We're bound by our contract. Um, but I think that's one of the, the idea of who can, request deletion and when, especially when under a contract with a school um, is going to need to be clarified um, moving forward. Uh, so I mentioned most of this in my, in my presentation, but we will need to define um, how to define the most privacy protective law. And this is, that's sort of a broad, um, more broadly, we we need that not just specific to the education sector. Um, and as Emily um, talked about the business and service provider definitions in the California law, um, service providers are only defined as providing services to businesses and do not, um, service providers um, cannot be ed tech providers providing services to schools or um, cloud computing services providing services to the um, DMV. Um, and under that, how, how would that play if a consumer contacted a company providing a service to say a government entity? Would that service provider need to um, provide access and deletion rights to the consumer? And I think that's something that um, needs to get clarified. Uh, like I mentioned in the FERPA section, deletion rights um, under, uh, I mean, FERPA there um, and uh, uh, CCPA uh, in the schools need to be uh, clarified. And just COPPA generally, I know uh, many of you have been paying attention to what's happening at the Federal Trade Commission, um, but the Federal Trade Commission is considering some um, possible, the possibility of some guidance on how deletion rights happen um, in the schools under COPPA. Um, they held a workshop in December on that. So I think um, once the Federal Trade Commission comes out with something there, um, it might give us a little bit more guidance on the direction, or it, it would at least provide us something to point to as we um, work to get the California law clarified. Um, and I know Mark is going to go over this uh, next. So I will let him clarify on how the relationship between SOPIPA and CCPA are going to interact. Um, and with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Really appreciate it. Um, so like Sarah mentioned, we're gonna turn things over to Mark. Uh, Mark Williams is a partner at, let's see if I get this right, Fagan, Friedman, and Bullfrost. Did I, uh, did I get that one, Mark? Okay. Mark, are you are you with us? Can you? Um, oh, we can hear you now. Uh, go ahead and take I, it away. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm embarrassed to say I do not have PowerPoint uh, slides today. You will have to listen to the monotony of my voice for a few minutes. Um, I'm going to be talking today about the contracting implications from CCPA. As we've heard from other speakers, the new act provides new rights for consumers and new duties for certain types of businesses. From my perspective, as a drafter of contracts between vendors and school districts, the new legislation raises at least two issues of interest to us. First, 
how does AB 375 fit in with existing state law regarding student privacy, namely AB 1584 and SAPICA? Second, does CCPA have an unexpected consequence of improving the contracting environment for school districts? Spoiler alert, I think the answer may very well be yes. So let's start first with the existing uh, structure of contracting in California, which for California school districts, which is AB 1584. As many of you may know, AB 1584 requires contracts between school districts and digital providers to contain certain provisions to protect the privacy of student data. The focus of that law is managing the data relationships between school districts and the vendor, not individual consumers and a vendor, and not individual students within the district and the vendor. There are exceptions to this, of course, but the thrust of it is AB 1584 talks about the relationships between school districts and vendors. In contrast, CCPA 3 CCPA is not focused on school districts, but individuals. To give you one example of how that works, if you look at the statute, the person making requests for data and information must be a natural person. So that's not by definition a school district. So from my point of view, AB 375 will have little direct impact on existing district digital contracts. To me, that's a good thing. And I think that's a good thing because we have shown in California and in other states steady progress in bringing enterprise level digital products under district based privacy agreements. And that includes the CSDPA, the model agreements adopted in a number of other states, and the efforts of the SDPC. But let's switch contracts to enterprise from enterprise level products to individual apps that are downloaded by at school sites or individual schools. I think this is where things get interesting uh, for the CCPA and existing uh, district contracting. School districts and school district organizations have had a tough time penetrating their contracts into apps that are acquired by individual teachers and school sites. Why is that? Because it's a fragmented market. Um, you have to go, it's, it's costly and expensive and burdensome to go after individual apps and try to contract with them. And secondly, and this is an unexpected um, impact of SAPIPA, SAPIPA provides a safety net for both vendors and school districts so that educators know that even if they don't have a contract with the um, individual vendor, so people provides a safety net of protections and rights. So the good news is for, with SAPIPA is it provides a safety net. The bad news is, in my opinion, it serves as sort of a institutional break to further penetration by a, a normal contracting process. Educators say, well, we've got SAPIPA, we're not gonna have to worry about a contract that comprehensively describes our duties. That's where the CCPA turns this world upside down, and that's why I think it's gonna be beneficial for school districts. If you look at the statute, you know, in particular that 1798.175, it's pretty explicit that the new statute is supposed to be a bolt-on to SAPIPA, to supplement rights, to expand rights under SAPIPA. So what that's going to mean for um, educational app developers is they're going to need to vastly expand their functionality, to vastly expand and be consumer directed, you know, to respond to requests for deletion, additional information. 
And the business models of most apps aren't directed in that way. So I think what's going to happen is the people that normally would be content with SAPIPA and its uh, lack of institutional control are not going to be content if you're an app developer with um, the new law. So what's the impact of that? The impact of that is you may start to see a migration of app and app products into an AB 1584 model. And it's my opinion that an AB 1584 model with a comprehensively developed contract uh, will provide a coherent, more productive and less burdensome model for apps and districts to adopt rather than just staying with the existing, with the new structure of the CCPA. Um, and how do I know that that will be permitted under the CCPA? Well, I, I think it's, you can see it in two sections. Under 1798.175, the statute is explicit that it, it wants to encompass the SOPIPA statutes. It is silent on AB 1584. Secondly, it doesn't make sense from an administrative point of view to permit CCPA rights in an AB 1584 environment. You know, strictly speaking, under the new law, a consumer can delete information. Well, how would that work with the school district? You know, as a student, would a student have a right to say, please delete my D, please delete my suspension? So I don't think as a practical sense, the statute um, was meant to supplant AB 1584. So what's the, what's the upshot of this? The upshot of this is, I think there'll be a natural meeting of app developers and school districts where they will contract for the first time to manage their data relationships in a party to party way, as opposed to leaving it just to students and individual teachers. And it's my position that a school, this will benefit a school district because the uh, importance of a data relationship isn't just restricted to the elements raised in the new statute, but it's a comprehensive management of a relationship. So I think um, in an unexpected way, this will help formalize and centralize district contracting practices to encompass apps as well as enterprise software kind of race through that. I think I'm done. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks. Uh, appreciate it, Mark. Um, so now at this point, uh, we've had all of our speakers talk um, and we'd like to turn to kind of a, a Q&A part of the call so that we can start answering those questions in the Google Doc. Uh, before we do that, I want to kind of remind everyone that we are under Chatham House rules. Um, so all of this is off the record and not attributable. Even the uh, statements you are directly asking questions about, consider them to be off the record. Um, but we're gonna, I'm gonna take a little bit of a moderator's prerogative here and throw questions out at all of our speakers. Um, so you guys can just kind of jump in and answer these as, uh, as you kind of would like, or you know, if you, if you wanna speak to, to the question, um, I'll just throw it out. So we're gonna go ahead and start with the, the first one, which is, why should anyone not from California care about this law? Hey Tyler, it's Emily. Would okay. you like yeah. me to take that one? Sure. Yeah, I can. I can throw it. At, and yeah, Emily, that'll 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 work. All right. Well, I'll, I'll start. I mean, generally, at a high level, the law does apply very, very broadly to businesses which are um, collecting the personal information of California consumers. So that means if you're a website that's operating in Massachusetts and you only have um, you know, writers and uh, operations in Massachusetts, but you've got a sufficient number of California consumers who read your site every day, and particularly if you have behavioral advertising trackers on your site in order to um, uh, raise revenue through uh, advertising and affiliate links, um, you could be captured under the definition of the statute. 
And similarly, anybody whose business is operating solely in Europe, but is directing their services to the United States and whose services are available in the United States, including particularly to California consumers, could be captured. Um, you have to meet those thresholds, you know, the, uh, the numbers, 50,000 more consumer information is being collected, annual gross revenues, whether or not you're driving your, your revenues from the sale of consumer business. But it, it could apply to you if you've got California consumers using your services. Now, there is an exception under the statute, which I don't have in front of me, so I'm going to quote it poorly. But the, the exception does exclude business information that takes place entirely outside of California. And it goes into quite de uh, some detail. So it even emphasizes that um, data, which is uh, stored on the consumer's local device and then not collected by the, by the business until the consumer leaves California would still be captured. So the exception only applies if the, California, if the consumer happens to be outside of California when they do business with your company and the company does not continue to collect any information about that consumer once the consumer returns to California. Um, so, so broadly speaking, uh, it captures quite a lot of businesses regardless of where they're located anywhere in the world. Now, there's a wholly separate question as to how it can be um, um, enforced against some of these companies outside of California or outside of the United States, uh, but that's sort of a second, secondary question. The statute itself does apply if the consumers are from California. Great. Uh, thanks. And so, uh, Sarah, I have kind of a follow-up for you. Um, so I, it, it's it's a bit of the same question, but we're you know we're we're also hearing rumors about a, a federal law, and I was wondering if you could kind of speak to the same point about uh, why anyone not from California should care about the law. So uh, so I, I I won't get into the um, technical aspects of the California law like Emily did, but just generally speaking, um, uh, when GDPR went into went into force in late May. I think um, we had a lot of people sort of scrambling. Um, I, I won't swear on this call, but I think they said something to the effect of, oh, shucks, what is that European law we need to think about? Um, and uh, got to it really sort of late in the game. Um, I think one of the reasons to pay attention to this California law is because we're seeing a new trend. Um, uh, privacy is, um, uh, is interesting, and I think politicians see it as something that their consti constituents care about. Um, and the fact that this California law passed so quickly um, and will likely not um, dramatically change um, uh, will and we might see copycat legislation in other states or um, legislation that um, either is um, more prescriptive or even or, or um, reaches into um, more industries at the federal level. I think it's important to start paying attention now so you sort of have the the um, vocabulary ready um, when you, your company or even your, I know we have a lot of school groups on here, um, when your company or if you're working with companies um, as these new laws pop up and you might need to comply with them um, before you're ready. All right, uh, thanks. So kind of a new question for, for folks, will the, will the CCPA require EdTech vendors to get consent from each parent before a student can use their EdTech tools in the classroom in, in the K-12 environment, even if the student data collected by the EdTech vendor is only collected or used for the purpose of delivering the relevant product? I'm, I'm happy to take that. Um, so I, I don't think it, does. Um, and I think this is one of the one of the conversations that um, this touches on one of the conversations that a lot of folks um, in the education privacy space have been having is um, how do you get meaningful um, parental consent um, in um, from parents um, in the classroom? I know there have been some studies that touch on um, what what that means and how do we, how do you know that parents are getting provided the information that they need. And, and not over, overwhelmed. 
um, because uh, uh, parents have varying levels of ability to um, um, to follow what's going on um, in this space. Um, and also, um, I think just more generally, uh, ed tech companies don't right now have the capacity to have the relationship with the parents. Um, their relationship has historically been with the school as a service provider, um, whether it is a student information system, um, providing sort of the back end um, to um, make sure that student, uh, that teachers can take attendance, um, or if it is just a spelling app um, uh, that is used in the classroom to help kids learn how to spell better. Um, I think that, uh, that that's a relationship that ed tech companies haven't traditionally had. So um, this, if, if that inter interpretation of requiring parents, ed tech companies to go directly to parents um, would get put into effect, I think um, it would not only um, require sort of a, a dramatic change in the way that things work, it would also require ed tech companies to collect a whole lot more information um, and also sort of take the schools out of it. Um, and um, I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's in school obligations to protect student privacy out of it. And I don't know if that's the best approach. Uh, this, is hey, this is Emily. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Oh, we'll go, we'll go Emily and then Mark, how about that? Okay, great. Um, I just wanted to add um, that the concept of parental consent under the CCPA is limited to when the provider sells data. So if I think I heard the question correctly, um, the question involved, uh, would, would an ed tech provider be required to get parental consent when they are only collecting and using the student's personal information in order to provide the services, the educational services to that student in the classroom? So assuming that that is the case, the ed tech provider is collecting and using the information solely for the purpose of uh, providing the educational services and is not selling or disclosing it to any third party um, for a non-business purpose, uh, then, then the CP CCPA doesn't, the consent requirement doesn't kick in. And, and that's also consistent with how an ed tech provider should be operating in the classroom anyway. In order for a school to permit an ed tech provider into the classroom, um, in theory and, and usually in practice, that ed tech provider is only permitted to collect and use students' information for the purpose of providing educational services. They're not permitted to share it and sell it with downstream third parties. They're not permitted to use the students' information or to sell it for behavioral advertising purposes, et cetera, et cetera. So in theory, um, in the classroom, when the ed tech operator is uh, providing the services directly to the child, under both the PIPA and AB 1584, um, the, the CCPA should not uh, impose additional consent obligations. Now, happy to hear if Mark agrees with that. Oh, no, I, I'm in, Emily, well said, and I'm in full agreement. The, I would just add that um, a proceeding under an AB 1584 model and the school official exception, you could avoid um, the, the whole dilemma, but I, I think your your comments were well put. Okay, uh, thanks. So I have a I have another question, um, and Ariel, I'm going to throw this one at you. Um, who is considered a consumer in the K twelve environment? You know, people are having that debate outside of the K twelve environment too, um, but I think consumer should sort of be understood at this point very broadly and would include students, children, parents, depending on the, the site. It could also include a, a teacher doing something. Um, but right now I would interpret it broadly. There's, um, there's sort of discussions going on about if the law applies to employees, um, and the, how it works in the employer context. I don't think you even need to, I guess, go to that question to, to think that it applies to students and parents and teachers using outside sites and services. Uh, anyone else want to weigh in on that? Uh, Sarah, maybe? Um, I, think, I think it's this 
law, I think the the important thing to consider is it's not a K-12 specific law and it's not a higher ed specific law and it's not an education specific law. Um, so so um, it and it applies um, in the when when you're at its heart, it applies to for profit businesses. Um, I saw that somebody on the chat just said that we should clarify that, but it does, it applies um, to for profit businesses and there's a qualification. It's like making $25 million in revenue or sell it or has this many data points or um, there's one more thing. Um, but I think uh, what, as we're getting in the weeds on this, it's always important to take a step back and look at um, who needs to follow it. And it really at its heart is a business to consumer relationship and figuring out mm -hmm. we we will need to get definitions on what that that stuff means but um looking looking at it broadly like ariel said is i think the important thing to look at right now yeah and i i think that tees up another another good question about kind of the scope of the law so i'm gonna i'm gonna frame frame this uh kind of the way that the questions did does, so does this law affect how nonprofit education organizations can collect student records data for, for example, attendance, course, test score data, things like that? Um, you know, for example, what about an, an organization that typically collects student data with minimal PII without names or addresses, but some birth date, race, IEP status, etc.? Um, or kind of as, a, as another person put it, does the law apply to nonprofits working in education with minors? Um, since nonprofits are non-commercial. I was hoping if we could expand on that a little bit. Hey, this is Emily. Um, I'll take my first stab at it, although <laughs> this is really going to be a bit of a brain dump because I think that that's a really good question and it's not easy to suss out given the black letter language of the statute. Um, so my reading of it uh, currently is that the statute applies primarily to businesses which are for-profit entities. And Service providers are also defined as uh, for-profit entities. And um, interestingly though, there's another definition, and I think I alluded to this in my slides when I indicated that service providers defined a couple of different ways, or at least it's, it, it's um, theoretically uh, sort of referred to a couple of different ways. There's another definition for third party, which is defined as um, uh, anybody who is not the business that collects the information or a natural person to whom the business has disclosed the information for a business purpose. And, and I'm getting into the weeds on the language here, but it's interesting to note that they use the, the phrase a natural person to whom the business disclosed information, as opposed to the service provider definition, which they refer to the for-profit entity. So there is embodied in the black letter law of the statute, a concept that a business could refer to, uh, could disclose data to a um, nonprofit, um, under that exception. Or otherwise, the nonprofit, if it doesn't fall under that, it, it would just be a third party. It would be defined as a third party within the statute itself. Um, so I don't, think it's, I don't think it's quite clear how nonprofits fall into this. I think if you, if you consider the, um, the goals of the statute and what they're trying to achieve in terms of protecting information that's being disclosed to a third party, then it would make uh, very good sense to um, to interpret the statute as meaning a business could disclose information to a third party, including a nonprofit, and it would be subject to all of these same sort of contractual protections that other service providers are under the statute. So I, I think that that's a that's a pretty big challenge when you've got an ed tech provider who is a nonprofit that's receiving information from a school, which is also a nonprofit, and how those two things fall under the technical definitions of the statute um, and the, um, the, the, the spirit of what the statute is trying to protect. Um, and I also wanted to just flag that there is a pretty hefty ex exception for the use of personal information for research purposes. It, if, it's, if information is disclosed to a, a party for research purposes, subject to a whole lot of different um, caveats and that information is then you know, that that party using it for research can use it and not be subject to the access requests, the deletion requests, and so forth and so on. Um, so, so sometimes, depending on uh, 
how the nonprofit is using the information, um, it could be excluded by, under the research definition. So I, I'm not sure I actually answered your question, but hopefully I highlighted a couple of different provisions within the statute that, that uh, could certainly use some clarification on this piece, particularly in the education context when there are a lot of nonprofits who are handling data. Thanks. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious, Ariel, did you have, do you have kind of opinions or thoughts on this? Um, I, yeah, no, I think I agree with Emily that nonprofits are not really directly in my mind, directly included in the, the definition of, of businesses. And, but that's something that is not sort of, they could be, as she noted, a third party as you go further into the, into the weeds on this. So I think that's something that could be clarified and that's something that could probably be clarified and, and in, in my mind in a, in a rulemaking, I don't know that that would, or a technical amendment, I don't know that that would need a, a further, an additional bill. That's just my take. All right. Thanks. Um, so I, I, I kind of want to ask another sort of related question about scope. Um, and this one, uh, Mark, you may, I'm going to give you uh, kind of the right of first refusal on this one. So if the law doesn't cover a school, since the school isn't a business, and an ed tech vendor is a service provider to a school, then school service providers presumably are also not covered by the law if they are processing data on the school's behalf. And it's kind of similar to, to FERPA's school official logic. Um, do you uh, do you kind of have any reaction or thoughts thoughts uh, on that? And and the just so that I'm clear on the question, the the service provider is processing data on the on the behalf of the school district. That's right. Oh, I, I would think that under AB 1584, that there would be an explicit inclusion of them into FERPA and AB 1584 protections. Just by the uh, yeah. of, of their data processing. Yeah. Um, cool. Uh, anyone else want to weigh in on that? Okay, cool. Uh, so is, uh, is CCPA's actual knowledge standard the same as or different from COPPA's? If it's different, how will that affect data collection from online or mobile services that kids under 16 might use? This is Ariel. I can take an initial stab at this question. I think it is different from COPPA's because COPPA's actual knowledge standard has been interpreted to have pretty sort of strictly actual knowledge, like someone gave you their birth date, that they were under 13. I think, you know, seeing a photo of a kid with six candles where they look like a six-year-old yeah. may not constitute actual knowledge that yeah. you were dealing with a six-year-old under COPPA. Um, it's something that, you know, children's advocates have thought some companies were, using this to their advantage and kind of ignoring the fact that they have a lot of under 13 year olds on the, on their apps or platforms or sites. Um, and there are obviously not sort of a number of different ways you can look at age. You could, you could go with, you know, reasonably should know the person is under 16. I think this is somewhere, it sounds like it's somewhere in the middle. It, um, it's not as quite as high as COPPA's actual knowledge. Um, but it, is not it's also sort of a higher mental standard than reasonably should know you have to be sort of willfully disregarding yeah and actually as a, as a oh sorry go go ahead uh, uh, this is emily I, I just wanted to add uh, to that if i may um you know i agree with everything that ariel just said what i think is really interesting is the willful disregard um provision so under COPPA, um, COPPA tried to get around that by saying, yes, you may have actual knowledge. However, on the other hand, if your service is directed to children, um, which is a fact-specific inquiry, so the FTC or another regulator will look at whether or not you've got cartoons and what the content of your site is to determine whether they believe it's directed to children. So COPPA says if your site's directed to children at, in, in whole or in part, meaning child, children are a 
partial audience of your service, then the site is required to presume that everyone who visits the site could be a child until they learn otherwise, such as by implementing an age screen. Mm -hmm. So that, that COPPA places an obligation on the business to, um, to, to learn the, the age of the visitor if the site is directed at least in part to children of that age group. So I think what would be really interesting is how we interpret willfully disregard under the CCPA. Um, if a, you know, teenagers make up a huge portion of an online audience, so if you've got a general audience site which knows that children from 13 to 16 make up at least a portion of their audience, in fact, maybe they're even directing um, their services and trying to attract those folks, if a site's trying to attract those folks, at least in part, as an audience to its website, is there going to be a similar obligation to presume that website visitors are that age uh, and then go out and find out whether or not they are by implementing a, a similar age screen? Um, that would certainly be a pretty high standard if the CCPA is interpreted that way. Um, but it, the way it's drafted right now, it says that companies cannot willfully disregard the child's age or else it will de be deemed to have actual knowledge. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's quite arguable that that imposes an obligation on the company to investigate and try to determine how old the, its users are. Um, if indeed that's the case, and that's how it's going to be interpreted in order to provide the most protections to children under 16, then that's certainly going to impose a, a, a new and pretty burdensome standard on companies that had previously avoided these types of burdens by excluding kids under 13 from their service. So I, I, have a, I have a bit of a follow-up for, for you, Emily, or and maybe for Sarah, if you want to jump in on this. Are there preemption arguments under COPPA, uh, at least for the age groups it regulates? Um, and kind of what are your thoughts on the, the patchwork of consent ages? You know, I would... That's one I, go ahead, Emily. <laughs> well, I was going to say that's one I'm going to take a little bit of a pass on without sitting down with my briefing book and coming up with a memo. Um, so, so happy to hear you, you chime in here. I think that there's a pretty good uh, argument for um, the conflict of laws. Although COPPA doesn't necessarily preempt um, regulation of children or the collection of children's information if the, the, the regulation is um, stricter or more protective. Um, but again, you know, I, I think that this is certainly an area um, that lawyers will continue to argue over for the foreseeable future. <laughs> Sarah, if you have a, a better response to that, I'm really, I'm all ears to hear it. I, I don't really. Um, I have, um, I was, I actually saw this question on the Google Doc and was doing some research um, a short, um, just a short time ago. And I actually honestly do not know. And it's something that um, we need to look at. Um, grant, and I think it's important to keep in mind that COPPA is just, is under the age of 13, so the group of the the, the yeah, ages the yeah. 16, 16 year olds, the, there's no there's nothing to that's 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 new and different. So there could not be any cop of preemption on that 13 to 16 year old um, thing. But um, just on the general, how does how does COPPA and CCPA interact, especially in the um, preemption world? Um, I got to do some digging. This is Ariel. Just throw out some more thoughts here because um, I know whenever you try to pass uh, privacy legislation that applies to teens and kids, people do raise COPPA preemption. Um, so I'm sure it will be raised here. I think from, from our perspective at Common Sense, you know, COPPA explicitly preempts inconsistent regulations. I don't think that this is inconsistent for the under 13 year olds. Um, and also, uh, in the past, when California has tried to do stuff to protect teens' privacy, people have said that's preempted because COPPA only protects under 13-year-olds. And you know, the FTC and the California Attorney General have, have come back and said states are free to do, to do more to protect teens if they want. Um, so I'm, I'm sure we'll see this, this argument. But I guess common sense in my view is that we have pretty good reasons to think that the specific provisions dealing with under 13 and under 16s are, are not preempted. 
Okay, so there's thanks. not a um, ton of so, case law, obviously. So, I, yeah, um, I was I was hoping to direct us kind of quickly back to uh, an earlier question. We we got asked to make a clarification. Does does the law apply or not to school ed tech service providers, and how would it differ if instead of processing data under under the control of the school, the ed tech provider is processing data under the control of the teacher? That is, it, the, the teacher has used an ed tech product in the classroom and directed the provider to process the data for, for the teacher. Um, so I'll, I'll take this one. Um, so um, FERPA generally, um, and I think Mark or Emily could get more into the state laws, um, but generally if a teacher is, um, what I'll just use sort of layman's terms, if a teacher is signing a contract with an ed tech company, um, it, 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 it would probably be looked at um, by the U.S. Department of Education as similar to the, um, like a principal or superintendent signing contract. Um, so so there, there's not really a difference there, but I don't want to give the, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't necessarily think that ed tech com companies are out of the woods on, <laughs> and that's probably the wrong term, but out of the woods on compliance with this one. I think it's just not clear yet on how ed tech companies need to comply because the definitions are not clear on where they would fall, if they would be a service provider or a business. If for some reason ed tech companies, when they're, even if they're contracted with the school, if later on, like a year from now or two years from now or three years from now, if they, if somebody says no, ed tech companies, even if you are con contracted with the school, you're still a business. Um, and this would be crazy um, to say that parents could go directly to the ed tech company and request deletion without even talking to the school, or a 17-year-old could say, delete all my grades because I don't want my grades in the system anymore. Ed tech company, I think that would that would probably not be the best outcome, um, but it's something that I think personally needs to be clarified um, uh, before this goes too far um, in the technical correction side of things to make sure that students' education yeah. records are protected. Yeah, this is Emily. To, to add to that, um, I think there's a, there seems to be a pretty reasonable argument that when an ed tech company is collecting and processing the data solely on behalf of the school, um, pursuant to a contract which limits its use and disclosure, like the, the hypothetical question presented, um, there's a pretty reasonable argument that the school, um, that the, the school is not a business for the purpose of the statute. Therefore, the information that it's passing to the ed tech provider is not covered by the CCPA. Um, and instead, that relationship would be would still be covered by AB 1584 and by SOPIPA. And um, it gets, and I think that that's arguable. I don't think that that's a slam dunk because there's still some, we could argue you know, a million different ways to one and then this interpretation could still change for sure. Um, but I think it does get really interesting when you're an ed tech provider who may be used in the classroom, but when students are interacting with you directly, not pursuant to a teacher first engaging in a contract or a you know, click through terms of service with the provider in order to collect the student's data. So lots of third party providers offer services that teachers permit to be the, their students to use in the classroom, but the teachers don't first engage, right? So in that instance, the ed tech provider is acting as a controller. They're collecting the information and determining how it's going to be processed. They're collecting it directly from the child. Um, they are uh, using it for their own purposes. Um, maybe pursuant to SOPIPA, they're using it for a limited set of circumstances and they're not um, you know, selling it for behavioral advertising purposes. But I think in those circumstances, um, there's a pretty good argument that the CCPA would apply to that practice. And and um, to expand on Emily's comments, I think um, we frequently um, get trapped in the education space talking about kids. Um, but I think when we're when we think about this in the higher ed context, there are a lot of services provided to students um, yes. in college, and um, that they're the ones that are interacting directly with the ed tech service provider. Um, so, so especially for those companies or um, higher ed. Um, groups that are um, 
LEA, either colleges or universities on this call, I think it's important to think about how um, this will work in the higher ed setting and um, what you need to think about as you're deploying tools in the classroom. So that actually leads, segues perfectly into the next question that I was going to ask, which is, does CCPA affect uh, K-12 and higher ed differently? I was wondering if you guys could weigh in on that. Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll take a first stab at this. I think, um, I think, in the ways that it would impact higher ed and um, uh, K twelve differently, um, are probably solely because of the, or mostly because of the other laws that apply in um, those distinct um, groups. If it's higher ed, um, there are. Um, there are financial um, laws and other things that might apply um, higher education act um, and then uh, and then obviously in k-12 you have um, state student privacy laws and um, other laws that may uh, may play but I think just broadly speaking and again to clarify this is not specifically an education law um, so this is this is this is a broad law um, that uh, you can see sort of as an overarching privacy law. Um, and Emily, you might have some more on that. You know, I, I think I want to emphasize your point to the last question, which I think is really spot on. Um, in the K-12 context, a lot of the tech providers are offering services where they collect information about children from the school themselves, or they collect information from the child, but only pursuant to the, the teacher or school district um, first engaging the provider for that service. In the higher ed context, there's a lot of services that are, are providing services directly to the college age student, um, not necessarily pursuant to a, a contract with the university. So I think that there's um, a higher likelihood that those uh, higher ed focused tech providers would be um, more likely to be subject to the CCPA simply because they're acting as controllers. Um, two, and, and, and this is a little bit of a, um, uh, uh, I'm sort of brainstorming here, but I think another um, provision to consider is uh, towards the end of the statute, there are quite a few um, terms that, that highlight uh, that this statute is intended to control um, it, and when in conflict with other laws that may apply to the same data, that this one will control, particularly if it's deemed to be more protective. Um, so I'm just thinking about the K-12 context where K-12 data is covered by AB 1584, by SOPIPA, by the FERPA um, parental rights provisions. When you get to higher ed, um, the state laws really go away and FERPA instead transfers most of those rights to the student. So there's probably a good argument that many of the provisions of the CCPA are indeed more strict um, and more protective and would take precedent over conflict. That in and of itself is uh, questionable because you're talking about a federal law versus a state law and you're talking about data which is regulated by the university or, or kind of owned by the university. Um, so I think that there's a lot of uh, uh, legal wrangling to kind of work through there. Um, but I would, as a general uh, rule, I would certainly say that providers offering services to the higher ed space as well as the K through 12 space should uh, certainly be aware of, of the CCPA um, and, and uh, likely expect to uh, be subject to it. Okay, uh, thanks. So un unfortunately, it looks like we are out of time for the webinar, um, but we do have a lot of questions left. So what I would like to do is um, for anyone who has questions that they would like to be answered. Uh, what you can do is you can follow up with me um, and I'm going to, I'm dropping information about this in the chat. Uh, send me an email with your questions. Uh, my email is tpark at fps.org. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll kind of make a big list of those and see if I can get our speakers to answer them. And then uh, once we have all of those answered, I'll circulate the, the, the questions and the answers back with the group so that we can get everyone's questions answered to the best of our ability. Because we know that this is, this is important, it's timely, and it's confusing. And we would like to do our best to clarify everything for all of you. So 
Um, I want to thank each and every one of our speakers um, for sharing their time, their thoughts, their insight. I thought the discussion was phenomenal. And um, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for joining us. So um, with that, uh, we're going to sign off and look forward to talking to all of you soon. Thanks.